there are certain things that we have to teach it to understand that they're, they're worth something. This is worth something. So my name is Jeremy Moore. We've got this, we've got a very small company. Um, it's called Moore Outdoors. And one of our brands is Dogbone, which is the brand of products that we do for dog training. We also have a brand called Hodig. You see my shirt, his shirt. Um, our booth over there is, we're the same booth, but we're just split one side is Dogbone and one side is Hodig. I've got, um, I wrote, I wrote some patents in, I started in 2009 with them, but we patented a product for training shed dogs. Um, it's this training dummy. <clears throat> we saw, I didn't bring it, I didn't bring any, this is how good of a salesman I am. I didn't even bring the products that we sell, but, um, so we sell these as a kit and we sell them individually, but it's a, it's an antler shaped dummy and it's, I'll, we'll explain the purpose of it and the reasoning for it, but it was, Back several years ago now that we, we, I wrote the first patent. I, I did it while I was working a construction job. I did it at night and I did it on legal zoom. Um, since then, we've, I've committed a lot of time and, and ended up leaving my construction job and doing more outdoors. And we also have a product called Hodeg and we have some patents on that as well. It's a deer communication product. And um, to, I've always trained dogs and I've always owned dogs. But when we went, I started training them kind of professionally, I guess, um, meaning simply that I got paid to do it um, in 2003. And so it's, I've trained a fair number of them. Over the years, I've worked with a lot of dogs. We, we, we do some workshops every spring where people will bring their dogs and we work on training the trainers as much as anything. But I've seen, you name it from a breed standpoint, I've, I've seen them come through. And the title for this work, or for this seminar, I think we called it uh, shed training for all breeds. And I, there, we don't, Hugh sent me, I'm, I'm really lucky and I appreciate Hugh who runs Deer Fest. We've been at every Deer Fest except one. Um, obviously not counting last year with no show, but the two years prior to that we missed, we had some family stuff come up and we weren't able to make it. But every year we've done a seminar at Deer Fest since. So I'm really proud of that. And we've done different topics. We've done blood trailing, tracking, we've done shed stuff, we've done foundation stuff. They all kind of, they all kind of mix together. Like they're, they're not, I don't like to compartmentalize my training. Who in here uh, should get a little feel for what we have? And you guys can sit down if you want, feel free to take chairs, but um, who has dogs in here? Because I like to, when we do a seminar, I think it makes sense to try to like address, uh, this is gonna be really informal. This isn't like, um, it's certainly not like rehearsed. It's the, like things will happen in this. I always put a little disclaimer out there that my dogs will probably make some mistakes today when I work with them. And I think that that is a little risky as a trainer to show your dogs making mistakes, but I also think it's more valuable to you because I'm not big on demonstrations. Um, we're gonna do a, a show later this month, it's a waterfall expo up in Oshkosh. And one of the things we're gonna do is a seminar, training seminar, and the other thing they asked us to do is a demonstration. And I said, yeah, we'll do it. But I'm gonna be real clear at that, that a demonstration is not nearly as valuable as a seminar. And I think the reasoning is, is demonstrations are, can be inspiring. I've, I was in those seats, like I, I, I've, I sat and watched a lot of people talk about dogs over the years. I still do. I'm actually looking at next, I'm getting a, a pointing dog and I want to get a little bit more well versed in it. So I'm looking at a couple different workshops that I'm going to probably sign up for to take for, from some trainers that actually one of them is, I write, I write for a magazine called Gun Dog and I'm on it, really honored to be a part of that. They did their 40th anniversary, 40th year of Gun Dog magazine just this month. And so, the last two years I've been able to contribute to that. One of the guys that's also writing for Gun Dog right now has workshops on pointing dogs and I'm gonna sign up for one. I'm gonna to go to it as a attendee. And I think it's real important to try to continue to learn stuff. So I've sat in the seats and I've watched a lot of people talk about dogs and I've seen some that are real valuable to me and I've seen some that were pretty frustrating to me, especially early on. The reason I don't do a lot of demonstration is because a these dogs are all six, five, and eight years old, and they will make some mistakes, but they'll do some stuff that maybe your dog's not doing yet, and for v a variety of reasons. But what gets frustrating is, is when you watch somebody do something with a dog, 
and then you go home and try it. Like you can leave real inspired, motivated. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. That looked really easy. He made it look very easy. Then you go home and you try doing it and it doesn't work that well. And then what? Because that the seminars, we're gonna talk more about like the struggles, some of the things, the approaches and the reasons why we do some of the stuff we do. So we will, we'll, we'll work them a little bit. What will be challenging to these dogs, and it's funny because they haven't done much the last few days. They've been in our booth quite a bit. So they, they have a nice disposition, a pretty nice temperament. They're pretty relaxed dogs. But when we get done with this and I go back to the booth, within 15, 20 minutes, they all three will be sleeping. This will be mentally challenging as much as it will be physically because it's a new room. It's a bunch of people. I will have them run around a little bit. I'll have to have them, I'll show you some of the control stuff that I think is important. But this will be, this will wear them right out. And we were talking, some of you guys I was talking with before, and so this will some of be repeated, but people ask me a lot of times, you know, boy, how much time do you put in? I just don't have the time. You know, you, I, I have a dog, but my, ex, my reason it won't listen that way is because I just don't have the time. You're a trainer. You've got all the time in the world. I'll be honest with you, a very small percentage of my day is training dogs, like specifically. I've got one client's dog right now named Callie. She's a little yellow dog. We're doing a series on YouTube with her called Callie Keep On. That dog, I do set aside some time and I focus on some things because I've got her for a relatively short window of time. I've had her about seven months. And we're trying to get her to a point this fall. Uh, sure. Oh. Is she, do you have to go? Are you just dancing? Do you have to go potty? Because we're, we're not done crate training this one yet. Now there's a nice, observ there's a nice observant very, not, way to read the dog, you know? But so she also just likes to dance. She's got a lot of dad in her. You should see me on Saturday night. But, so uh, the idea with what, and I don't, I've kind of broke my train now, but what we're going to talk about today is the idea of some of the shed stuff that we do, but probably, and we talked about the time, the amount of time I put into this stuff. And I think that people are intimidated by the idea of it takes so long to do that. And how, how you got a 15 month old, 15 week old. Yours is nine months. nine months, and he was at a you were at a workshop this last year, so he knows exactly what I'm talking about from the workshop standpoint. He came to one of our spring workshops. Your dog is you've got a Dalmatian that's five years old, but you're on the market maybe for a puppy in the next little while. You've got a nine year old and a four month old. And what's the four month old again? Sixteen week old Springer. Uh, Springer. Springer, right? Yeah. What well, do you got a dog? I have a. Lab German okay, how old? It's about seven. Seven, okay, perfect. You guys got dogs? Man, thanks for sitting and listening. <laughs> cool, very cool. Uh, you got a dog back there? You guys got dogs? What do you got? We have a black lab, um, Okay, I'm a, I got a little soft spot for Goldens myself. I was raised with Golden Retrievers. My family, my mom and dad have them. We've got a series on a Golden Retriever that was real, real, uh, high energy. Cedar, what was the name of that one? Golden Opportunity. So that was on our playlist. Do you have a dog back there? Yeah, five-year-old. Five-year-old lab. So some nice kind of a variety in this in this group. Um, the young, I really think people ask me, well, where do you start? You know, and, and I, I want to know what do you have? Like, how old is your dog? I do think that matters. But my answer to where you start is never, it's always the same, it's in the beginning. So I don't care if the dog is seven weeks, seven months, or seven years old. You have to start in the beginning when, it start, when you start talking about shed training. Because in the beginning, so I, I like to, when it comes to training a dog to find an antler, dogs don't, find, dogs don't pick up antlers for me because they like antlers. Um, they pick up antlers for me because they understand that the antler equals something that's real positive and that's a re for this dog a retrieve. So yesterday we did a tracking one and I had a, I talked about a hunt command and I'll probably talk about that yet today. We, did, we took a piece of carpet, we took a handful of food and we sprinkled it on that carpet. And at home I would take the lawnmower and mow a, mow a circle in the grass and I'd leave the grass a little bit taller on the inside and leave a nice clear defined spot where there's cover. 
Doesn't have to be waist high. It just needs to be cover, especially for little dogs. And then I take food, and I'm not a treat trainer. And we talked about this a little bit in the booth for some people. I think, I think treat training is, is bribery in a lot of situations. I think what we do is we get spoiled little brats out of it. You know, I got a two-year-old girl, girl over there that's having a hell of a lot of fun. And she's really, really having a good time. If I told her, if I asked her to do something and in order for her to do it, I had to give her a piece of candy every time, what would happen when I stopped giving her the candy? Like I'd, I'd have a real handful on, uh, in, my, in my lap there. I, I think these dogs, when I walk around, someone that watched the seminar last night came up to me and he mentioned it after. He said, you know what I think you should mention and talk about is uh, you didn't, but I noticed it real quickly. He said, when you walk around in that seminar, there's a lot of stuff going on. But he said, what you really should note is everybody look at the dogs. So as I walk around the room, and when I walk up to them, he said, you should really talk about like some of that body language stuff that those dogs give you. Because when I walk up to the dog, he said, your dog gives you really incredible eyes. They really look at you. And then that tail wags. And it really tells me that the dog really likes you. Like I, I don't look at the relationship with my dog as like, well, it kind of is an employee-employer relationship. Like, I'm, I am a little bit higher up in the pack than them. But I also think it's very much mutual respect. Like, I, I treat them pretty well. I don't think I need to trick them into doing stuff for me. I think sometimes the treat training turns into a little bit of trickery. I'll give you this if you give me that. Now, I, get, I like the idea of dogs wanting to work for stuff. But I think what we have to understand is that dogs were domesticated and they're wired to please us. They really want to make you happy. So I like the idea of the relationship of I'll give you something, I'll give you some praise. That's worth something. It doesn't have to be kibble. It doesn't have to be, I don't look good with a fanny pack. <laughs> so I'm not walking around with a bag full of food all day to get my dog to sit for me. I'm also not big on Collars, shock collars, I don't use them. I've never used them. I don't think I need to. And, and I, I don't, I think that's a whole seminar in itself probably. I don't really get into it much, uh, especially in this type of setting, but I don't care how people train their dogs. Like I'm not here to say how not to do it. I am here to say how we do it and have found a lot of success. And I think it's important because there's a lot of people that don't want to use a collar. And they don't really, real, they don't know maybe that it's possible to do it without it. I've never put a collar on any of these dogs. And I think what's interesting is you'll see a lot of, it, I, there's issues that can come with the idea of treat training and quote unquote bribery. The, if, if the treats stop, so does the behavior. Uh, who was I talking with about short, dropping short? So they were talking about treating for the retrieve. And there's a whole, I know a lady that in the UK that that's her whole thing. Like she's, she's really building a, lot, a nice following of people that want to, I don't know what she calls it, reward-based retrieve or something she calls it, but she builds it around the treat. Here's what I think happens and I've seen it happen is the idea that we have to always be careful that what we're training in, sometimes the best training can be avoiding a bad habit in the first place. So like that's a real thing to think about. Like what are you creating by potentially doing something? And if it creates an issue down the road that's a bigger hurdle, you want to avoid it in the first place. It makes life a lot easier. I see some of these consequences. They're not, they're unintended consequences that happen. When dogs, dogs are really smart and they anticipate stuff and they like to get a step ahead at times. And so when we, when we treat a dog for the retrieve, Let's just break it down and think about it. If the dog brings me this dummy, nice and steady, we're not in a hurry, we're not, nothing's gonna be rushed, heel. Spry. A lot of enthusiasm, kind of like on a skating rink here. Figure out how to pick that thing up, Get a nice hold, come back. Good, good. P wait patiently. If that was a bird and it were alive, it's not going anywhere. 
if it were a cripple and she dropped it because she said, give me my treat. <laughs> I, I did what you asked me to do. Dead. Place. So that, that to me is real nice. I like, a, I like a nice polished delivery. I call that a nice hold and a nice deliver. And you can do it however you want. Some people really like that fancy spin to the side and get next to you. I don't like that because when they come out of the water with one of these and they're wet, and they come up and they swing into the hole and they go, oh good, and I take the dummy out, what do they do? Shake. And I get wet. It's the only reason I have dogs delivered to the front. Because when it's nice and cold in November and I found a new friend, the girl's left her, she says, oh, will you pet me? Uh, and when it's nice and cold in December and that birds are really starting to come down, and that dog comes out of that icy water and comes up to the front and gives me that bird and then shakes off, and then I say, okay, go lay down, and they get into their spot, I'm dry. Where I don't like that dog coming to the, so it's the reason I like a front delivery. I don't, I don't care if you deliver to the side, but that's just a simple thing about how we do some stuff. But you all saw how nice that was when the dog, dog comes up and holds it for you. There was no chasing, there was no catch me, there was no playing, oh, wanna come and get it, wanna come and get it, wanna come and get it. There was no running around victory laps. There was none of that stuff. The treat part of it, a lot of times, when in order, when you think about it, if a dog picks something up and then they come back, and the reason they're doing it is because I'm coming out of the fanny pack for them, is they got to spit this thing out in order to get the retrieve. So what ends up happening is dogs come up and they spit it out and they go, pay me. Well, that's a bad habit. So then what happens is, okay, I pay you. Good, nice job, here. And we don't think anything of it. But then the dog goes, two, three steps short of getting to me and they go, give me the food. And then they start dropping it halfway to you. And then they might run out to the thing and go, it's right there, now give me my food. They're super smart. So they'll take advantage of that. So I go, no, 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 no. We finish with you saying, dead, good. And you know what? The reward for her was not the idea of, I got food, the reward was, please send me for another one. I know how happy that made you. Like, the retrieve is the reward. Duck dogs don't pick up ducks because they like ducks. Shed dogs don't pick up sheds because they like sheds. They pick up sheds because I've taught that dog to realize that something that looks like this or smells, I don't have a bottle of scent with me, but smells like an antler equals retrieve. You know what her last name is? Labrador Retriever, Golden Retriever. These sporting dogs, their names are what they do. Pointing dogs, point. Retrievers, retrieve. The Spaniel is one of the best retrievers you're gonna find. So most dogs have retrieve in them. We have to figure out how to bring it out. And then we gotta figure out what should bring it out. Because when you walk down the road, you know, in the springtime, we gotta put value to this thing. And the value is that reward, or that retrieve. And we'll praise on top of it, just to be sure. But when you walk down the road in the spring, the ditches in Wisconsin here, the snow melts, and the ditches get, they're full of pop bottles, right? Empty pop bottles. People throw them out, beer cans, pop bottles. Ditches are full of them. And so I look at that and I go, man, it's, they're not worth anything. So what happens? We walk right past them. I, I have no interest in picking them up. I mean, I like to pick them up in front of my house because it looks better. But there's, there's not a lot of people racing out in the spring to grab all the cans because they're worth something. But think about it this way. What if there was 100 bucks in each one of them? If there was value to every one of those pop bottles, how many would you see in the ditch? None, because we'd all pick them up. Because now they're worth something. This dog, there are certain things that we have to teach it to understand that they're, they're worth something. This is worth something. The pop bottle, I don't necessarily, now I have little puppies that'll pick pop bottles up because they don't know any better. Hey, 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 hey. Place, come on, come on in. Enough, enough, enough. The pop, the, my little puppies will pick up those pop bottles. My little puppies will pick up my wife's shoes. My little puppies will pick up Lillian's toys. See those little shoes, see those little shoes over there right now? That happens a lot at my house. So little puppies pick those up and run around with them. And what if it's mom's $200 pair of pumps? 
I mean, the shoes can get expensive, right? I, I don't even like to think about it. I don't tell my wife what some of my stuff costs, and she doesn't tell me what hers costs, and that's okay. But sometimes when she sees the dog, the little puppy, carrying around some of that stuff, her eyes get this big, and I go, ooh, that probably is worth something. And so the last thing we want to do is, no, 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 and chase that dog down the hall. Because the dog's going to go, wow, this is great. <laughs> She'll chase stuff around. This is really a lot of fun. Instead, what I do is I go, opportunity, Taylor, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Taylor, come on, come on, come on, come on. I get right down and I go, oh, come on, come here, come on, come on, come on. And that puppy looks at me and goes, okay. And they come and they wiggle into me and I praise them and I take the pump out of the mouth and I say, dead, good, and then I give it back. And I say, hold on to that thing. Oh, you're a good girl. And then I pick it up. And then I do that two, three times. And then I look at my wife and I go, where should I put these? <laughs> I don't tell her to put them away. <laughs> I ask her, where should I put them? And then I go put them away where the dog can't get at them. So we create a lot of issues that form bad habits that we end up having to deal with. Does anybody in here have a dog that likes to run off with something in their mouth? She's got one. They've got one. So, how do you fix that when it's there? We set, this, we set them up for success. And so most of my training starts out in really simple areas. So this is a great one. Like this, would be, this is a little bit big, but see how long this corridor is? If I close all the doors and make sure they're all closed, I could send a dog down that row. Well, actually we'll do this. So here's the reason why this training dummy is so valuable. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. Now I'm gonna see if I can get that lady before she gets in the bathroom. <laughs> Stay there, I'll get you with the next one. <laughs> so, now look at this one. Reaching out, please pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Really, I like that, nice and steady. Ellie, Ellie, Ellie. Sit, right here, sit. Ellie. Go back. Go back. Go back. Ellie. Go back. Go back. She says, I don't know about those guys. Sit. Go back. Go back. Here. Read, read her body language right now. She goes, I don't think so. <laughs> Heal. Heal. Ellie, Ellie, go back. 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 Good girl. Good girl. Come on. Come on, there, there, come on. Ellie, come on. She said, boy, this is kind of fun. Come on. See the body language right now? Come on, good. Come on, good. Good, right here, right here. Good. Dead, dead. Sit, good. Now, this is perfect. So that did not go as well as I had hoped. If it had, it would be a demonstration. Because you'd all go, oh yeah, that was, that's the way it goes. But you know what? She had a lot of hesitancy to go down that corridor. She had a lot of hesitancy to get past that spot. There was like an invisible barrier in her head. I can't go past there. And there's guys down there that I'm not sure what I want to be down there with. She's a little uneasy in this spot right now. But as she went back, as she went back, as she went back, and you heard me go back, Go back, she knows what go back means. If I took her out into a field right now that was very little distraction, I'd stop her on a whistle and I'd say, go back, and she'd spit dirt at you, because she'd turn around and go. You can take that call, I might be interested in who it is. <laughs> so so the, the level of uncertainty here changed things up. So now what I'm gonna show you is, okay, I'm a trainer and I have to adjust to things. So. You saw me just throw that out there. She didn't see it. So really for her, it is somewhat a little bit of a blind. She didn't realize it was down there. She looked down the aisle 
and I doubt she saw the white dummy against the glare of this floor. She saw some people and she said, you really want me to go by those strangers? So we had, to, we had to convince her, we had to push her through. Now, watch the difference. So we throw dummies for dogs and they're visual and it taps into predator prey and they chase and they're retrievers and they go and they pick stuff up. And the reason that this is this is because when she picked it up over here and she slid in on that floor, she grabbed it and she fumbled around and if you notice, she picked it up three, four, she tried three, four times to get the right spot to get it. If this were, the reason this is this is because when I first started with shed dogs, I had a six month old puppy that was done teething. We had a real nice foundation started. I was gonna start retrieving with her. I took an antler. It was the first dog I was gonna train as a shed dog just as a shed dog. I pitched a hard antler for her. It looked a lot like this. She ran up to it. She hit it and she went <coughs> and came running back with her tail between her legs. And I, my, I went, what just happened? It was on an icy road. I remember exactly where it was. We had just walked my old, older dog through. We were looking for sheds. We found that shed. And I thought, well, I'm gonna give Finn an opportunity to pick that up. And that's what we did. And then every time I picked up an antler, Finn ran away from me. She thought this thing bitter. She thought that hard horn had bitter. It poked her, it jabbed her. You know how many people that I tell that story to at a show like this in a week and go, yeah, same thing happened. And now my dog does not like sheds. You ever hear gun shy dogs? Gun shy dogs are not born gun shy. It's not a genetic thing. It's conditioned in and it's not intentional. Most of the time people don't do it on purpose. The guy that, that you always hear the story about the guy that takes out the 12 gauge shotgun and goes, I'm going to see if he's shot gun shy or not. And he starts shooting over the puppy. And now, lo and behold, the puppy doesn't like it. Well, that's not the way to introduce a dog to gunfire. But what creates the most gun, so a lot of times we don't realize it. And I'll, tell, I'll ask people, they're talking about their gun-shy dog, and I'll say, well, what happened? No, nothing, nothing. I never, you know, we never shot over it early, none of that stuff. But then we start digging into it, and we realize that that 4th of July, they didn't really realize it, but everybody, the neighbors really put on a nice show and scared the hell out of Sparky. And you didn't even realize it. I had one guy that couldn't figure out why it happened. Well, he had building a brand new house. Had the puppy, new house, new puppy. Put the puppy in the crate, in the, ken in the kennel, in the crate, in the garage and the roofers were putting the roof on. Dog can't stand gunshots. Real uncomfortable situation for that puppy. Not the way to introduce them. So dogs are not born gun shy. We condition it in. Dogs are not born afraid of an antler, but if he runs up to it and he pokes himself in the nose or the eye or the mouth and they're a little puppy and they're a little sensitive, they look at that thing and they go, stay away from that. It doesn't feel good. So we want to always keep in mind what do these dogs see for the first time and make sure that the stuff we want them to like is positive. That's why scented tennis balls are real valuable. I've yet to meet a dog that doesn't like a tennis ball. So I'll take antler scent and put it on a tennis ball and I'll roll it across the ground into a little bit of cover. Let the dog use its nose and find the tennis ball and be real happy when it does and understand that the way he found it is by using its nose. Now, you saw me throw the dummy down there. You saw what happened. Heel. Ellie, heel. Ellie, heel, come on. Heel. 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 Now let's see how she does on this one. Come on. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way she was supposed to do it last time. But she didn't. And look how high she holds it and how proud she is. And oh boy, good girl. Dead. Dead. Good. Sit. So who saw the difference in that one versus the first one? A lot of difference in the confidence, a lot of difference in you know, how she went out. But did you notice the difference in how we set it up? The first time I threw it down there into a hallway, not even intentionally, but straight people down there, a lot of different stuff, new area, never been in it before. People standing down there, throws it down there, doesn't even know it's there, ask her to go into the abyss. She was real hesitant. We got her through it, we helped her, we helped her, we helped her. Second time I did it, instead of me throwing it down there without her seeing it, instead of having people down there, which it wasn't intentional, but 
Instead of all that stuff, what did I do? I told her, heal. And she walked down there with me, a little sloppy, wasn't the best heel work I've seen, but a little sloppy, but she went down there with me. I had no worries about her running off. She wasn't going anywhere. She wasn't fooling around with anything. We stopped. I pitched the dummy three, four feet in front of me. I said to her, watch. I turned around and came back. I got to here, I said, watch. And when I say watch, she cues in and goes, what do you want me to do? Watch. And I could send her right now. The difference was she'd already been down that hallway. She's confident. No worries there. She walked down with me and picked that thing up off the ground. She knew it was safe. I, held her, I healed her down there. I healed her back. But what happened was is if I couldn't get the dog to heal, I wouldn't have been able to do that drill. So we were talking about heel work, I think, in a, with, with you guys. There, I didn't have to worry about heel. She knows how to heal. So the foundation part the idea of when a dog goes out and picks something up and I say, here, they come right back to me. When I say heal, they heal with me. We set that up a lot different. You know what the biggest difference between that one and the one that I threw down there was, was the delay that we put in. So a lot of times the dogs will pick these up when we throw them all day long. And you can throw it, I, people say, I threw it into cover, I threw it into the thickest, nasty stuff, they find it every time. But when we're shed hunting, we walk right over them and the dog won't pick them up. And I said, well, how do you train? Well, I've, I've used your dummy. I've used the real antler every time I throw it. And they go, it's because they're scent on it, my human scent on it. That doesn't have anything to do with it. It's you're teaching the dog to understand that everything it, it retrieves needs to be thrown or, or shot. They need to see it moving. I got news for you. When you're shed hunting, you're not going to watch a buck run across the prairie and drop its antlers and send the dog on it. I saw it once on YouTube. <laughs> it doesn't happen. So what ends up happening is this dog's got to use their nose and their eyes. They've got to search, quarter cast, and all of a sudden they come up on that object. And they've got to understand, I shouldn't just keep moving. I actually have to pick that one up and bring it back. What we just did with that trailing memory is we taught a dog by delay, by putting it on the ground and putting time in between, putting distance in between, we get them to start understanding it doesn't have to be thrown for me to pick it up. The other thing that we can do is we can start extending distance for our retrievers. I can only throw so far. I've seen it a million times where people send dogs on retrieves and they're long and they send the dog and it's from here to, for me, it would be from about here to the door across there. And you'd send the dog and the dog would run a nice steady line until he hit that spot. And then it would start to break down and hunt. And, they, and the people get frustrated because it's double that distance to the dummy. And they go, I just can't get him to go any further than that. That must be the capacity. That's as far as he'll go. Well, I also then say to them, take a dummy and throw it as far as you can for me in that direction. And so they take a dummy and they throw it as far as they can in that direction. And by God, it lands right at that spot. And they can't figure out why the dog won't go beyond that. But every retrieve we throw is that distance. And the dog memorizes how many steps it takes to find it. Because they've done it time and time again. And they go, run 47 yards and start to look. Because that's where it is. Well, I can't, I can't teach you to throw 90 yards. We just can't do it. So what we have to do is have to change the distance. So, Put it out 47 yards and then tell the dog heel and walk back another 45 and turn around and send them. And they'll go 90 yards then because we just laid this memory for them. We're always working on memory with the dogs and they have short term and they have long term. And retrievers, we want to build up the long term for memories of things. But the short term part is where timing comes in to training. If I place train these dogs and you've got a little puppy and the puppy jumps off the bed and runs across to him and you pick the puppy up and say, no, 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 and you put it right back on that bed, the puppy thinks the problem is going to him. Don't go to him. He doesn't like that because he just told me, no, 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 no. The problem was when the dog jumped off the bed. So what I have to do is be t able to read the dog and go, he's about to jump off of that bed. No, 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 no. And then the dog goes, oops. Sorry about that. And then I watch again, and the dog's kind of getting a little antsy, and I can just see he's coming, and he goes like this, and I say, ah, 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 and they go, whoop, sorry. And then I do that two, three times, and then the dog starts to go to the edge of the bed, and then he goes, and lays down. And I go, good boy, good girl. And they go, that's what you want? 
Now all of a sudden the timing of when I corrected and when I praised makes sense to the dog. Hell, just stay on here, leave me alone. That's what they want me to do. So timing short term is important. So the short term part is throw the dummy, send the dog, that's marking. This was set the dummy down, we added 30 seconds. That's beyond the dog's short term memory. Now it turns into a long term thing. And the dog starts to get value out of that rather than the idea of, oh, I always gotta pick stuff up real quickly when they throw it. I watched a dog, I've watched dogs over the weekend. Dummies thrown, about the time that hits the ground, the dog's there. There's just no patience. There's just no steadiness. And when we start building that in, that's very cultural. And so everything we do, most people when they run into issues with training, I tell them, slow down. I had a guy yesterday that told me he's done with foundation. His dog's five months old. He wanted to know what to do next. I, and I, it's probably the one part of the day yesterday that kind of like my blood pressure went up a little bit. I'm a pretty cool guy. I'm pretty relaxed. I used to be a little bit shorter. I was in construction. You guys are in construction. I had a little bit of a short fuse in construction. And so dog training has helped me grow to be a better dad, be a better employer, be a better coach. I used to coach some stuff because I've become more patient. You know why women are better dog trainers than men most of the time? They have a tendency to be a little more patient. It's the most underrated skill a trainer can have. It's patience. Because when things don't go right, we have to look at it and go, what did I do wrong? You know how hard it is to ask yourself, what did you do wrong? It's really easy to tell you what the dog did wrong, that damn dog again. 99% of the time it's because of the way I set stuff up. I didn't set it up very well. So I've become, my mindset has started to look at it and go, well, what, what happened there and why and what could I have done better? And then all of a sudden, I've also gotten a lot better at impulsively correcting. Instead, I go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. And by that time, that, in, that, that initial, <clears throat> I really am pissed right now, goes away. And I go, okay, let's think about it, figure it out. That's where that collar gets in the way. When I'm pissed, all I gotta do is push a button. And I don't feel a thing, but it makes me feel good because that dog really jumped. I don't like that. That's, that's not natural. So I'm big on the idea of when we, when we run into those issues, try to figure out why. And then do it differently next time, make an adjustment. There's no, like, dog training is really fluid. It's not one, two, three. Every dog is different. My wife is a really good cook. She's not a very good baker. She, baking takes real precision. This is not, dog training is like cooking, not baking. If you screw up baking, the ingre ingredients have to be perfect. The timing has to be perfect. You have to do all these steps, and if you don't do it, it doesn't work out. But my wife makes a hell of a venison stroganoff. But they're all different. <laughs> she, I told this, she can't hear me, can she? Uh, the, she, made, she makes chili. She's probably made chili 50 times in the last few years. I've never had the same chili twice. <laughs> it's always good, but it's never the same because it depends on what we have for ingredients. It depends on lots of things. Hell, I had one that was really weird up north. She had weird ingredients. Turned out pretty good. But these dogs, this one, this one, and this one are all three different. The amount of time that I, this one didn't make a nice retrieve for me until she was about 10 months old. Bella, who we just got done, done training and sending back home to her owner, was retrieving at about 10 weeks old. Really well, just a very nice little natural mouth to her. So my approach with Bella was different than Spry. And that'll be different than her, and it'll be different than Chief, and it'll be, but the general direction, we go in the same, we go the same way. So, I don't know what time it is, I'm probably pushing it. Huh? At 12.45, so we're good. God, I never end early. The last time we did this one, uh, and I'm not saying we're done, but I get nervous about it because the last one we did on Friday night, I looked at my watch, just, or I don't like looking at the phone during this, so I pulled my phone out thinking, okay, are we close to that one hour? We were at an hour and 27 minutes, and I'm just like, ooh, no one was behind us, so that was fine. But I like to give time for some questions, too, because I think it's important. Um, I, I usually run a little late, and then we don't ever get to that. But does anybody have any questions? Like I said, this is really informal, so. I got one. Does it 
I know you always work with labs, but does it matter the breed? How you no. Eat? No. I, so it's a great question. And I do, I always own labs. I own a very specific lab. These are British labs. Um, we, I, we, she just had this litter and the reason we did that, we breed very limited very limited amount and it's primarily for me and my clients so we do train a, a number of dogs for clients each year a very limited number we're all about three and a half years right now with deposits so it's not it's a small part of our business but I'm a believer and we our goal is to try to provide you with products that you can use to train your dog and I think the important part about that is give them the information on how to use it so between our video series our, our social platforms we really try to push that me personally, I'm using the, a very specific dog and the reason is because it fits me very well. I don't think you all need a British Lab. Probably not, not the case. I match up my hunt style, my lifestyle, and my training style with the style of dog and I try to get it as close as possible to all, all of them line, align. Because what it does for me is it makes my life easier. It, it, when you put a round peg in a square hole, it doesn't work that well. So you have to force some things to make that work. And the, I, don't, I'm, 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 I like the idea of making my job a little easier as, or as easy as possible. So no, you don't have to have a lab, but I, I like them. But I've worked with GSPs and Weimarimers and Vizelas, and I'm getting a setter. Like I've, I've, got, I've been on a waiting list right now for about a year and a half, coming up on two years now, for an English setter. Not for, I'm not gonna shed hunt with it or track with it, I'm gonna use it for upland. But I waited, I looked for about two years, almost three years for the right kennel. I actually switched breeds. I started out looking for pointers. I started looking out for the, for the English pointer, but they call them pointers now, but that's what I thought I wanted to hunt upland with. I want to hunt rough grouse and woodcock and by, we've got a cabin in northern Wisconsin. I really enjoy that. So I thought pointer and I looked into a lot of pointers. I talked with a lot of kennels. I talked to a lot of friends that are into the pointers more than I am. And by the time I got done with that search, I switched to setter and a very specific setter. Like I'm looking for a setter that is a, a foot, foot dog to hunt off a of foot, not horseback. So I'm gonna, I want a close working range. You know, some guys will look at, hopefully, will look at my dog and go, you've got a boot licker. They call them boot lickers because they're so tight, they're all over. I hunt in really thick cover. I'm not hunting prairies. I'm not hunting plantations in the south. I don't need a two, 300 yard dog. And quite honestly, the reason I hunt grouse, I do love the bird and I think it's a real interesting bird and the best eating bird in the world, but I don't care that much about the bird. I enjoy the dog work. I, don't, I wouldn't hunt ducks if I didn't have a retriever. Like, ducks are nice, but not, I have no interest in doing what we do to sh shoot ducks, just to shoot ducks. I like watching the dogs work. So for me, as an upland guy, the last thing I want is to look at a GPS collar and see where my dog is and find out if he's on point or not. Like, to me, that's not fun. I, can, I don't play video games. <laughs> I don't wanna play a video game when I'm out in the woods. So that's me personally. Some guys are gonna go, well, you, that's not, that's not a pointing dog. That's a bootlicker. Okay, but I really enjoy it. It works for me. So I think the, the style has to match up. And for some people, I'm training, we're actually gonna be bringing in a little Malinois Shepherd mix, um, probably in the next week or so. I've trained, it's a dog named Arrow. We did a series on YouTube with her. Um, we're gonna work on her for some tracking stuff. And they're for, they're, she belongs to some friends of ours who are in Africa, actually, right now hunting. So that dog is gonna come in and we're gonna work with her. That's a different type of dog. Um, our workshops, I've seen all sorts of breeds. And some of, them I, some of them really grow on me. Some of those breeds I go, man, I really like that. Uh, it's part of why I switched to the setter. I really like some of the things. The setters remind me of Labradors with long hair <laughs> that point. They've got real warm eyes. They've got a very strong, you'll, you'll notice, I think important parts of dogs for me are connection, trust. I, develop, I work very hard at developing that with them and having them have that back with me. I have seen some breeds of dogs that are so independently working, they could give a shit if you're there or not. They don't care. They just wanna work. They don't wanna look at you. 
And I know some guys that like that robotic feel of the dog. That's not my style. So um, I, I don't think it's breed specific by any means and the training approach wouldn't be much different either. I, I have had people tell me, and I'm looking forward to it, I've had a lot of people tell me that pointing dog, very, and I don't, some retrievers, there's, there's guys in the retriever world that are just like it, there's guys in the tracking world that are just like it, there's, there's the extremists with certain things. And I have had some guys that are in that pointing world, they can't wait for me to get that setter and learn my lesson. You're not gonna be able to train that dog the way you train these dogs. So I look at that and I go, boy, I, I look forward to it. I think I will be able to. Does that answer your question? It's probably way... That, that was my second part of it. So, so you see, I see you work in the labs. Yeah. I had a point in breed before my... Oh, that's way, but I got a lab mix. Sure. So that, have you seen that applicable to other breeds? So you get, but the personality of a lab is a lot different than a point in breed. Yeah. Because... Yeah, some for sure. For they don't sit like... Yeah, well here's the thing, here's the thing about that, I think it's cultural, okay? I went into a camp with 11, 11 setters, they were all English setters, there might have been one red and white setter in there, but there was 11 setters in a, in a grouse camp last year that I stopped in at and we had a few drinks and, and I walked in and they had these beds just like this. And those dogs are laying on those beds, and I walked in, and not, a couple of them lifted their head to look at me. One of them came up, wagged its tail, I petted it a little bit, went back and laid down. But they were all like that. And they weren't all one guy's dogs. There were seven guys there that had the different dogs. And I, I have a little pack of my own at home, and, and I post some stuff on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, I'd encourage following it, you'll see this stuff. But I do some stuff on our stories. And I've got a, let, I got a 12 week old chief. And 12 week old chief is the fruits of her loins. I mean, it's her puppy. And so little chief would like to play and wrestle and mess with every other dog we've got there. And, and he, he tries. And so a lot of times I take the dogs out in the morning and I've got them all sitting and I'm doing something. And I look back over and chief, little chief, I don't ask him to sit steady he's not there yet so he he's bumming around and all of a sudden he's up to this dog and picking on it and then he's up to this dog and picking on it and then he's up to the and he goes through the whole group see if any one of them will bite you know and all the, all those older dogs are sitting there looking at me going get this little mosquito off of me right it's annoying and so finally and i film it i see it happen enough times that i go i'm just going to film it and show people and finally, little Chief checks through the list and nobody wants to play. And so Chief finally spins around, he looks at me and he sits down. And that's when I take the picture and I post it. And then a bunch of people will go, oh my God, he's got that 12 week old dog steady. No, he's not. He's just learning that everybody else does it. So I might as well too. So if you watch this, so that's the thing about social media you gotta be careful with. Our hope is to show as many of the things that I, there's a reason I show the video of the little dog bouncing around and screwing off to start out with. And then there's a reason why I show him finish nicely. And I'm not, there's a lot of, I, a lot of ideas of, well, just show the part where he finishes nicely and people will think you're so good. <laughs> I don't need to lie. I, I, I mean, it's, I don't, I'm not looking for business right now. I'm not looking for people to send their dogs to me because I don't take dogs in. But what I want to show is the idea of my dogs do things that are squirrely and then they realize it's not acceptable and not welcome. And then they go, I should do what the other dog does. So the point, so if you've got a group of dogs, because I have a group, I have buddies that have groups of dogs that are bouncing off the walls. They all are. And I'm not gonna bring Chief into that pack. Because that fuels Chief. And Chief says, well, this is acceptable. This is what we do. No, Chief says, boy, I gotta, I'll conform. I'll do what the rest of these guys are doing. And then all of a sudden, Chief's pretty fun to have around because pretty quick he starts to shift away from his natural tendencies of wanting to be a screwball to being, eh, sit nice and quiet, be patient. If the dog, yesterday, we, or Friday, we did a thing where I, my dogs are pretty steady, and I threw a dummy, and for some reason, Spry went after it, and I went, you just don't, now you don't get to retrieve. So she sat, and I used the other dogs. So she understood very quickly, boy, that was a mistake. So if she goes and screws off and runs off on me and then I say, no, 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 now you get a retrieve, she's gonna go, what is the consequence? If they, the, the quietest, calmest, steadiest dog in my pack goes first. 
And if you're antsy, you wait. That takes patience. I, I, can't, I can't get through my session as quickly as I'd like if I make them actually work to get there. So my session might just not cover as much as I thought it would. But it takes the same amount of time to get there. And I'm okay with that. And the beauty of this is, is none of you guys have the pressure on you of somebody sending their dog and you have to get it done in a certain amount of time. you got all the time in the world. And one of the things that I think we run into is we want to speed stuff up. We want to go faster, we want to go faster, we want to go faster. The best way to speed things up is to slow them down. It's counterproductive. It sounds really terrible. It wouldn't work in construction. But for a dog, it wouldn't work to a degree. If you go too fast and you make a lot of mistakes, it takes you a lot longer to get it done anyway. So there's a balance there. And I think in everything we do in training, we're searching for balance. Don't be too extreme over here and don't be too extreme over here. But when it is too extreme over here, you gotta start being a little more extreme the opposite. And then eventually it starts to work its way to the middle. I'm always looking for the middle. Anybody else got any questions? Yeah, I got a dog. He doesn't care about his balls. He doesn't really care about the bumpers. If I throw a frozen bird out there, or there's a live bird out there, sure. he's going to retrieve it. Yep. But all the rest of the stuff, as far as building and training up, yep. it's very frustrating. It makes it, yeah, it makes it a lot more work. So I would, so in that situation, and I've, I've seen dogs like that, a lot, some of that can come from intro to birds too early because the bird is way better than this. I mean, think about it, you know? I mean, if you got a ham sandwich or a chocolate cake and you give it to kids, they're gonna eat chocolate cake all day long and they don't want ham sandwiches. I, don't, I can't fault them for that. So some of, some of it has to do, I'm very careful with my introduction of timing. I really want the dog to really appreciate the idea of retrieve as opposed to what it's retrieving early on. So you've got a little bit, so even tennis balls aren't good for them? No. So, so when, you, when you have, how old's the dog? How old is the dog? Oh, three and a half. Yeah, it's real hard now. Yeah, it's gonna be real hard now. How about feather dummies? Is anything with feather dummies? You'll, you will do that a little bit, but so yeah. How often do you work with them? I work with them about three hours a day, about ten minutes. Take take about a month off. No retrieving. Just, and I'm not saying this will be the fix, this is what I would do. And maybe it's not even a month, maybe I'd start with two, three weeks. But what we've, what, you've got a problem, and, and I see it, I've seen it, and it makes it a real pain in the ass, because now I gotta have birds on hand all the time in order to get something done with this dog. And at three and a half, he's pretty young, so you got a long road ahead of you to have to deal with a freezer full of birds. So I would stop retrieving and take away all of, does he really like it when it is a bird? Oh, when he gets a bird, he's pretty excited about it. So, so stop, the re stop the retrieving, 100%, cold turkey. And then see, when you come back, I'm not going to birds for a long time. And see if we can't get a little bit of that desire to be retrieved and not necessarily object driven. So I'd take a break. Now that doesn't mean you take a break from training, because like when a dog goes through teething, four to six months old, they're gonna usually teeth. No retrieving during teething. Creates a lot of bad habits. Their mouths are sore, they wanna chew on stuff. So the last thing I want is that dog to go get that thing and lay down and start chewing on it. The last thing I want is for them to run up to it and their mouth hurts and they don't wanna pick it up. I don't, don't form a bad habit that you gotta train out later. Ellie, sit down. He says, I will, right next to this guy, because he'll pet me. <laughs> they're not dumb. So. But I would, when I say take a break from retrieving as they're teething, I don't say take a break from training. That's a real nice window to work on heel work. That's a real nice window to focus on some of that foundation stuff. So I wouldn't stop training because I would try to build even stronger connection with the dog during that break to get that dog to really dial in on whatever it is your weakness is. Yeah, I always have weaknesses with my dogs. So there's something there that could work on, that you could work on and should. Do that for a few weeks, and then come back to a, to a retrieve. The other thing is, does he, how are your setups looking? Are they very, are they challenging? I have some dogs that, Taylor here, gets extremely bored with training. 
It's, it's pretty much why it always got all his space. Yeah. So, so when you start back, challenge him in cover. And make it, instead of making it big, make it small. Use, you got any birds, you got birds in the freezer? I don't think I've got, not, not right now. So if you can get a hold of some feathers, okay. get a hold of some feathers, duck breast this fall, pluck the duck breast, pluck the down out of the duck breast, put it in a Ziploc bag, and put tennis balls in there. And then seal it and put it in the freezer. And keep those. Then you got really nice scented tennis balls for that duck dog. And so when you start back, take tennis balls with, a, with that down feathers and take them and pitch them into some cover and make the dog hunt with his nose and make the dog have this scent, but it has nothing to do with an actual bird. And see if you can get the enthusiasm back for, damn, this is a game. This is a challenging game. It's not so simple and easy. I can't hardly send Taylor on a, on a memory that's visual. She'll walk to it. She's just so bored with this. But if I run a blind with her, she goes, ooh, fun, a little challenging. So it's, sometimes we have to figure out what, what gets them going, what lights the fuse for them. But once you, I, then I'd, I'd steer clear birds for a while. May, may, might not ever need to go back to them. Because as soon as you do, you might go, dummies? <laughs> no. Good question. Time-wise, we all right? We're there. Well, right on time. This is the best I've ever done, ending on time. Uh, if you have more questions, you certainly can come to our booth. We're in the other hall. Um, we've got the dogs on the one side. We've got our hot egg stuff on the other. I think, I, I appreciate you guys sitting through this. Um, if there's ever anything I can help you with, you, there's a lot of ways to get a hold of us. Instagram and Facebook with DMs. Uh, be, be, pay, this is a good test of patience. Be patient with me because I get behind on responding. We do we get a lot of emails. We got a lot of different platforms where people are coming at us. Um, I would recommend following some of that stuff. It's you might the answer might be there already because our podcast we answer a lot of stuff repeatedly and, and it's questions from people that probably other people have as well. So it's all at Dogbone Hunter. So if you have any questions, I'm more than willing to help you. Um, you're certainly welcome to stop by the booth and talk a little bit more if you want to, but we're gonna pack up. I think there's a seminar behind us. So thank you, you guys, appreciate it. <laughs>